contributions, not only to the ethnomusicology of, of South America, in particular Colombia, but also in the areas of um, critical approaches, applied approaches, and sound studies. Uh, so without further ado, please help me in welcoming Dr. Anna Mariachi. So thank you, everybody, for being here today. And we've had a bit of um, technical problems, as, you, as you've noticed. Um, some of the, the films are central to the talk, because of course, this is a talk about the films. But I think two of them will work with the subtitles that we have. And then one of them, we'll see if we just turn the computer around and find a way of just uh, even in listening quietly to it or find a solution to it. Um, exactly, and you can use the microphone or something. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here after many years. Uh, I would like to thank the Department of Folklore and Ethnomusicology, especially David, for the invitation and Michelle for making all the arrangements to be here. When I was here as a graduate student in the early 1990s, Richard Bauman and Charles Briggs were in the throes of doing the background research and writing for Voices of Modernity. So our pro seminars were very centered on this history of knowledge. Um, uh, and how to think about it. Um, ethnomusicologist Dorothy Sara Lee, with whom I took the course History of Ideas in Ethnomusicology, had already done her project with the Library of Congress of returning the recordings of Alice Cunningham Fletcher to the Omaha. And I never knew, she gave a fantastic course. I used a lot of the bibliography of that course during that time, and I never knew that she was actually doing this project. I've learned about this project as I teach um, Alice Cunningham Fletcher. So it's actually quite interesting. And prior to coming here to do my graduate work in Colombia, ethnomusicologist Mario Eugenia Londoño, my neighbor and piano teacher since I was seven years old, mm -hmm. had first invited me to watch over the dialogic ed editing with Inocencio Ramos, a NASA indigenous music researcher, of what was then a VHS cassette that was meant as teaching material for indigenous NASA schools. Um, and I was 12 years old when I began doing that. So this usage of the video and of returning of materials, of uh, documents, of archival documents, then has a uh, history that becomes very intense in the 1980s. The NASA as other indigenous, group, indigenous groups in Colombia at that time were then beginning to control their own schools and education and needed teaching materials in their own language. So this initial phase of v VHS production was for the communities themselves. None of that material was to leave the communities. You were produce a video to use in the school to then um, uh, use for teaching uh, for the community itself. So the mode of production and the mode of editing was related to that. Maria Eugenia Londoño's work's significance in developing this type of collaborative work continues to be relatively unacknowledged both inside and outside Colombia because the product of such work is not the research paper. The same happens with Inocencio. It is, on, it is, on the one hand, the educational material done with the indigenous community itself, such as out of visual productions or school textbooks to be used in indigenous schools. And much of the work also consisted of methodologies of self-reflection and processes of knowledge appropriation, many of them derived from ideologies of liberation of the period and that were to then become constitutive of social movements. Although the general significance of these processes has been theorized within Latin American decolonial theory, and prior to that within liberationist writings on pedagogy and social movements, the, the significance of figures such as Mario Eugenia or Inocencio for ethnomusicological work has yet to be explored and acknowledged. So I briefly recall this 1980s period, not only to acknowledge with gratitude some of my mentors in the 1990s, but if there is a reason why the theme of critically thinking through histories of knowledge in Latin America and the Caribbean has been so central to different aspects of my work. It is perhaps because I became an ethnomusicologist in the midst of profound transformations of the field, not only in the United States, but in Latin America and the Caribbean as well. It was a moment of deep critique of an early 20th century nationalist paradigm that took form in the midst of the formation of social movements that were significant for changing the very politics of ethnomusicological work itself. I addressed some of these issues in my as yet unpublished dissertation. And although I will never publish it, I wish to return to some of the issues I raised there, but with very different framework, fieldwork, and in a, with a different conceptual apparatus. And so in this talk, I want to concentrate on the significance of audiovisual 
uh, production in indigenous groups in Latin America for rethinking the nature of ethnomusicological work. So, the decades of the 1970s and 1980s were central to the national and transnational consolidation of the indigenous social movements in Colombia. As Colombian anthropologist Astrid Ulloa has shown, their emergence as national and transnational actors was not only significant in terms of the struggle for their own rights, but has in turn transformed key terms of the public sphere, such as citizenship, participation, environment, and of course, the key, two key terms of nature and culture, which keep, keep coming up. So one of the interesting dimensions of their intervention is that it's not just a struggle for rights. It's that, uh, in effect, um, there were huge public discussions in Colombia on the nature of the new constitution and the participation in the social movements. And the type of discussion, the presence of indigenous and Afro-descendants in the public sphere, in the newspaper, and it changed dramatically. It's an, it, there's no way that that type of presence would have been possible before the 1980s. So this is not just an articulation of a social movement, it is uh, also a conceptual change of what we mean by those very terms that are being invoked as we talk about uh, these forms of participation. According to Ujoa, this process of politicization of the indigenous movement is related to the rise of the environmentalist movement and to the emergence of what she calls an eco-governmentality, a radical rethinking of the place of nature in the politics of the public sphere, which of course is happening in multiple spheres at the same time. But during the decade of the 1980s, audiovisual technologies also began to be used by indigenous groups through collaborative work, either with filmmakers, visual anthropologists, and in a few cases, ethnomusicologists. In this talk, I propose that central to the indigenous movement has been not only the rise of environmentalism, which is widely recognized, and the relation of this process to the politicization of nature in times of neo-extractivism, but also the transformation of audiovisual technologies and their relation to the, the politicization of culture in those same times. The nature and culture to classical South American themes or Melanesian themes come then uh, anew to become political actors again in the, in the hands of contemporary ind indigenous filmmakers. Um, I think that the rapid rise of audiovisual technologies as a fundamental means of documentation for indigenous cultures and the development of a particular form of audiovision is just as important as the environmental struggle itself in recasting the public significance of indigenous groups. Um, so in what I'll, what I'll try to do through some of this work is frame it a little bit against the background of my book, Aurality, but try to rethink this relationship of, um, on the one hand, a, a poetics of filmmaking and of audiovision that is done in collaboration by the um, groups themselves. Um, a rethinking of what that implies for ethnomusical knowledge, uh, ethnomusicological knowledge and the archive, the ethnomusicology archive. Um, in the book, Aurality, Listening and Knowledge in 19th Century Colombia, I explore how listening to voices was central to the formation of notions of the oral that were later to determine how the discipline of folklore and the study of music, especially popular music, was to be constituted in Colombia, but more broadly in Latin America and the Caribbean. I was interested and continue to be interested in a classical decolonial or post-colonial question. How are studies of music and of expressive culture more, broad, uh, uh, more broadly, how do they take shape in different parts of the world and among different peoples? So I initially began the book in order to explore a series of intellectual figures of the early 20th century and in Latin America and their role in the formation of ethnomusicological thought. However, as I listened to the radio programs they produced, I realized that they made continuous reference to a Colum Colombian bibliography that I had never read. Philologists, travel writers, botanists, poets, and others. So I turned to the 19th century archive to try to make sense of the endurance of the significance of these works for determining the concept of orality. To make a long stor story short and a folklore, it was evident that at the colonial crossroads, listening to beings that were understood as having voices was central to the formation of concepts of orality, of music, and of to what today we, co we call folklore, but was then called oral poetry. So what happened is that um, I find uh, the material in the archive, and part this book took a long time to write, took about 14 years. I was doing other things at the same time. 
but also became a very large project of research. And of course, I changed my archive. As soon as I began finding some of these 19th century voices, which would not fit into a paradigm of the oral or into language or into song or anything, I switched the material of the book. Um, and in the midst of that period, uh, listening studies began to emerge. So there were some early books on sound studies, but these, uh, uh, the, the series of books on listening began to emerge. So I begin to turn to that literature as a way of articulating the book. And so the book becomes simultaneously a book about how listening practices then define the concepts of what counted as a valid voice and what counted as a valid voice that was then uh, important in determining what the concept of orality was itself. Okay. Um, but what a close exploration of the archive revealed is that something much more profound was at stake than the epistemological politi politics that were at the center of, a, of an archaeology of orality. Questions about the voice were central to the 19th century formulation of notions of nature and culture, which in turn were central to the very concepts of orality and music on which our disciplines are based. Um, so today I think that the audiovisual communication by indigenous groups is central to recasting those terms once again. This is of course a classic South American theme that comes about in many types of ideologies and formats from let's say the levi strauss in question about nature and culture to the uh, magical realism and uh, certain ways of the way it cast that, that same idea of nature and culture. So this is a returning topos. Uh, when you think of, of South America. It's, uh, and I want to bring that history because it's not something that is necessarily new. Uh, it's a long history of the region. It, is, it always gets recast under different politics and different, um, let's say, uh, uh, theoretical endeavors. And it's returning then once again um, under different guises. So during the past, so this is sort of an introduction to the talk. And I'm going to go into some of the material that I've been working with. During the past seven years or so, I have worked with an indigenous film collective in northern Colombia, today called Bunquayumunum Comunicaciones, of the Wiwa indigenous peoples of the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, a mountain on the Colombian Caribbean, a territory that is also shared by three other groups, the Kogi, the Arawakos, and the Cancuamo. The Sierra is a mountainous formation that rises 18,700 feet from the seashores of the Caribbean and across three different states, Magdalena, Cesar, and Guajira. It is considered by the indigenous groups that live in it as the heart of the world. Other mountains can be the arms and the legs, but the Sierra is considered the heart. Um, the indigenous groups of La Sierra then consider themselves to be our elder brothers, our keepers of the heart. All others, including other indigenous groups and ourselves, are hermanitos menores, or lesser little brothers. As such, um, they, see that, or they see themselves as be, having been left in this world in order to teach the world how to live and care for the planet. So a lot of the environmental politics in which they engage have to do uh, with this idea of them being the elder brothers, the idea of the La, La Sierra being the heart of the, of, the, of the planet. So their own mytho mythological discourse of how and why they were left on Earth is central to the formation of their public discourse. This feedback sort of between a bureaucracy of the myth and a bureaucracy of the state uh, that comes up in certain poetics of the film I, I find to be um, central to what they're doing. Um, so this mode of speaking of actualization of a mythical time is a constant in their way they do the poetics of their political participation, of the films, and um, you know, of, of their political struggle. It goes then back and forth between these spheres. During the 1980s, as explained also by Estrid Ujo in her book, The Ecological Native, these groups formed a series of organizations, the groups in La Sierra that continue to transform according to both internal and external politics, and that have played a key public and controversial role in bringing, bringing a discourse of indigenous governments, governance and of environmentalism to the government and the public sphere. This indigenous people of La Sierra are very public. This is the main, like, you know, Time or Newsweek in Colombia. And there you go, the Mamos, which are the priests of La Sierra Nevada, pronosticate very difficult times. This is the main article 
that would appear like in Time or Newsweek. So their presence is extremely public. This is not just a minor presence. They have um, presence in the newspapers. Once a, a lightning fell on one of the villages in which they live, burned one of the houses, and this, was, this is national news. This is not local news of an indigenous group that is living in La Sierra. This is, all of this fear makes uh, national news. Um, in 1994, they managed to consolidate their territorial politics through official recognition of what was called La Línea Negra, the black line, which is that line that you see surrounding uh, the map. So they define this as their territory. The territory has a series of sacred sites, which are the yellow points that you see, and they are 39 sacred sites. And if you notice, this is the Sierra, this territory here. And there's major cities, Valle del Par, Santa Marta, are inside the territory of the, of the sacred line. And this is officially recognized by law as the borderline, let's say. And within that, you have a series of simultaneous, let's say, pol polities of territoriality, from uh, natural parks to um, uh, reservation to municipalities uh, uh, that work simultaneously and, of, co of course, contradictorily with each other. Um, uh, so on the one hand, while the territory is recognized, and this is a major accomplishment of um, the Colombian Constitution, which is a landing of grand rights to indigenous peoples, uh, the natural materials that lie underneath it are the predisposition of governmental authorities. So while this is happening, at the same time, the president is basically selling out La Sierra to transnational mining corporations that are going to uh, try to arrive at La Sierra at the same time. So we have the simultaneous uh, recognition of territorial rights of indigenous groups, and at the same time, this process of extractivism that is going to arrive in massively um, and to impact the Sierra somewhat, but especially the areas around La Sierra, these areas around here, are major coal mining operations. And what is, has, been, has affected them the most is that they want to build ports right here so that they could, the coal can be extracted through there. But right now in La Sierra alone, there are more than 300 petitions for, for mining, from mining corporations. Um, and it's in the midst of these different forms of struggle that the filmmaking in the Sierra begins in the 1980s um, or 1990s. In 1990, British filmmaker Alan Herrera, a controversial figure in La Sierra, whom I will briefly mention because of his historical role, produced a BBC documentary called The Elder Brothers' Warnings, in which he recorded the mamos, or priestly and political authorities of La Sierra, and their warning to the little brothers of the need to change the way and uses of the planet. Um, American photographer <laughs> Stephen Ferry also went to La Sierra, but began to develop a series of workshops to teach photography to in the indigenous groups themselves. So what happens is we, we brought this we brought the indigenous groups to New York City in an event that we did on media and um, uh, indigenous media north and south, comparing indigenous groups in the north and the south. And so one evening we were just working in my apartment to translate PowerPoints and do, do all these things that you have to do to finish the presentations of the next day. And they leave my apartment about 1 a.m. and they're walking towards where they're in a hotel 10 blocks up and they go into a supermarket to get some water or something. They're walking up the street and then somebody shouts from a car, we just saw you on television. They dress, as you will see, they dress in white with certain types of hats. And, and they're thinking, oh wow, Ana Maria and Aaron Fox really went out of their way to organize this event. And then they go, but they dismiss it, and then they go into the supermarket and the people again say, we just saw you on television. And so what people had seen was the Alan and Ada film. So the Alan and Ada film really made it across. And what they used, they used that event for the next day to begin their presentation saying, what we want is autonomy in our forms of representation. So this is a classic, you know, we take over. On the one hand, we get trained, but it, we also get, tra you know, have autonomy in who produces what and our forms of representation. It's a struggle, it's easy to say that way, but there's four indigenous groups of La Sierra. What they mean by autonomy and representation is not the same between each group. And in the early 1990s, amidst a drastic intensification of the war, the armed conflict in La Sierra, where right-wing paramilitary groups and left-wing guerrillas were disputing their territory, 
the indigenous authorities that decide that they themselves have to let others know not only what is happening, but also take responsibility for their role, for teaching their little brothers the care for others and for the planet. It is then that they invite Colombian visual anthropologist and filmmaker Pablo Mora to train them in camera work and film production. The first indigenous film collective of La Sierra was called Jigoneshi and involved the four indigenous groups of, La, uh, of, the, of the area and it fulfilled a fundamental role in forming them as filmmakers and of inserting, inserting them within a broader public uh, sphere of indigenous film circulation. But four years ago, the collective dissolved for reasons I will not go into here, and the WIWA formed their own separate communications collective called uh, Bunkwayamunum. So I wanted to show um, one of the films. We don't have sound. Well, we, we, might. Might. we might. Okay. So. So let me, let me just fast forward a little bit. Um, so the first production that they do with Shigonesh, I'm just going to give a brief background, is 10 seven-minute uh, videos that were, co that were television productions that were co-financed by Caribbean television. So they keep the rights to that, even though it's co-financed by public television. But um, in one of those films, they tell of the story of how they were how they formed the collective. So I'm simply going to show a little bit of that story in their own words. And uh, those, those 10 uh, short videos were called um, Palabras Mayores, which are, I've never found a good way of translating. Uh, it's uh, major words, but it's, it plays, of course, with the idea that there are elders and that these are elderly words. Um, and that's how they come. So. <laughs> So one of the first actions that they do is they arrive at La Sierra with the new camera equipment that they've just brought. So the first thing you do is you ha take the equipment to be blessed by the mamos of La Sierra, uh, by the priestly authorities of La Sierra, and at the same time you do a consultation of, of whether the projects are going to, uh, a spiritual consultation of whether the projects can take place. So um, this is the see, this is a fragment. This scene takes two hours, but this is a very small fragment of that scene. Eh, con la dificultad de que se vive en la tierra, llega un momento en que los mamos oh. deciden. With the with the difficulties in la sierra, comenzar a difundir el pensamiento. The mamos make the decision to uh, disseminate the thought of their own thought. Estrategia de and we decide a strategy of finding allies to defend the Sierra and the culture of the Sierra. So that's when we decide to um, use phot photography and video to explain our own modes of thinking. So that's the beginning of that. I'm just going to show a little bit of the collaborative work. This is the translator of the films. Um, menos le, le sería más difícil. Él utiliza una unas palabras. Which uh, the whole issue of translation from the mamos to the films to the modes of speaking in the films is a, a, a major issue of debate because of course what happens is a uh, the mamos speak for hours and then these are seven minutes of of elements. So the first issue is not only an issue of translation of words but of transformation. Uh, to the audiovisual format that happens. Uh, okay. Then the other question, of course, is how does the hermanito menor, how do we understand what they're trying to say? So there's layers and layers of translation. 
that um, are happen in these films, and then I just want to acknowledge Pablo Mora, who invited me to the project and has been the central person who has trained them and the, the different directors. So. So again, the, we've seen his capacity for working with us, but the most important thing is we're, we're generating a process of autonomy in the production of these representations. So I just wanted to give that background with um, Shigoneshi and turn to the um, other films done with um, Uchui, with um, Bunkwana Yuma. Okay. So the setting up of strategic alliances. So it's interesting what they call their, the people that work with them. So it's allies, um, and we can go into that uh, later, but it's the idea of an ally and the idea of, of a friend. So how the, the again, it's the, the establishment of these uh, bureaucracies of participation and uh, modes of participation that, uh, and the several layers that this involves. Involves on the one hand, uh, bureaucracy of the Western polity the signing of contracts, getting money from the Ministry of Culture, getting researchers involved, et cetera. But we also find what we will call a bureaucracy or setting up of a frame of authority of the cosmopolitics of mythology. Every single project, and this is now a formal guideline in the Colombian uh, research arena, if you're gonna work with indigenous groups, you have to do a spiritual consultation first. Uh, so it's, uh, that has been incorporated into these uh, types of spheres. And then it's, uh, of course, the mediation of the technology. In La Sierra in particular, the arrival of new audiovisual equipment and the beginning of every film project involves a ceremony of baptism that brings the cameras into actualization through a spiritual consultation, which asks if the collaboration being proposed between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples or the project itself can go forth or not. Such a ceremony and consultation are also filmed, generating not only the act of consultation itself, but a dispositive of authority that repeats itself every time the film is shown. Baptism, to clarify, is not about naming. It is about the transformation of an entity, and in, in this case, the cameras, from the mythical world into the physical world. In the mythical world, nothing is new. All is already in existence, but what exists in virtuality when it appears in actuality needs to be incorporated into a proper cosmological and mature order of belonging through ritual. So a lot part of this ritual was the discussion of the mama of what realm the cameras belong to. And in the Sierra there's lakes up in the higher end of La Sierra and since the lakes um, reflect light, the water reflects light, then the camera lenses also reflect light. So part of the logic that's the, log that's the logic that they ended up um, using. Um, what the baptism does is that, is that it allows the mamo through a process of spiritual consultation to place the new object in the cosmological order of their world and to inscribe their form of authority into the camera and the process of filming itself. Recently, the members of Bunquayanum and Comunicaciones have been working on a series of films about their own musical expressions and practices. One film, Ushui, was finished in 2013 produced by Rafael Mojica Gil and Saul Gil Nokigi, who we're, we're gonna see in a bit. The other entitled Shamayama, our music is being edited as we speak. Perhaps the most repeated sentence I have heard since working with them is, our music is not folklore. In Spanish, nuestra música no es folklore. And yet part of the motivation to do these films seems to be something which we have often identified as a colonial impetus of the early years of formation of folklore and ethnomusicology. The need to rest, register something in, in need of documentation because its presence was threatened by Western culture or because the elders who practice it were dying out. So in the Facebook posting about the production of the new film recently, um, You have this. Filming Shamayama, our music. In rec recent times, due to the strong penetration of Western culture with its technologies and different rhythms of life, uh, which of course they're also using, the disciplines that are proper to traditional knowledge and weaver arts have become fractured and have deteriorated. Little by little and in an imperceptible way, the younger generations undervalue the elements of our uh, cultural identity, forgetting the value and the functions of music and dance. Um, 
so this is a very traditional folkloric motiv motivation. So on the one hand, you, ha you have the layer of this mytho mythological discourse of actualization. And on the other hand, you have a very typical, uh, let's say, folkloric discourse about identity and loss of folklore and the need to recuperate. So both are working in tandem, let's say, at the same time. This is yet tied to another word for naming an expressive ob object. Amalia Cordova, on her work on indigenous film in Latin America, calls these films documentaries. Yet the indigenous peoples of La Sierra do not. Neither in Mexico and many places they don't. They call them communications. As a strategy of mediation between a cosmopolitics of life, the public sphere of the nation state, and us, non-indigenous audiences, these films question an easy inscription of these products into our own categories of film and of filming as simply a new technology of inscription or denunciation in a long decolonial struggle. That rather what is questioned as indigenous peoples produce films is this very status of the medium itself and of the way of linking express the expressive culture being documented by the film itself. So there's two layers on the one then there's what's being actualized in the film as what our expressive culture is. And on the other hand, it's what is the film itself that is sort of interplaying. Let us recall briefly that the very concept of orality was developed in the 19th century through specific strategies of listening to voices and determining their validity for a proper oral culture. All the films that the indigenous people of La Sierra and the Weba have done to this day inscribe a pedagogy of listening for us as a central aesthetic and political framing of their films. Just as the mamos speak to them, they speak to us. This is always framed by the centrality of the figure of the priest or the mamo, who is both a political and spiritual leader of the Wiwas, as a central narrating voice, or as a person that plays a key role in framing how the film should be seen or heard. But it is also framed by an inscribed act of self-reflexivity on the audiovisual medium itself and of ethnographic description of who listens to women's voices or to different voices. So what I'm going to do in what follows is sort of play three of these clips. I think the material is more interesting than what I can say about it sometimes. So I'm just going to thro sh throw some of the, uh, show some of these films. And I'm going to focus on, you could focus on many issues in these films. But I want to focus on three moments of, in which they ask us to listen in a particular way. <coughs> um, so uh, the first is a... <coughs> A, an acting of, so they're going to film Ushui, and they're, gonna, they're filming Ushui because they have received feedback. Um, th this collective is all male indigenous filmmakers. They had to have, they, liked, they tried to have a woman, but she stayed in Bogota living and didn't come back to La Sierra. And other collectives, like the ones, their neighbors, the collectives in La Guajira, are almost all female. So it changes from one indigenous collective to another. <coughs> So they were criticized because um, two of these indigenous groups have female shamans, and none of the female shamans were <coughs> interviewed in the initial 10 seven-minute productions. So they decided that they're going to do a film on the female shamans, or sagas, which only <coughs> two of the groups have, the Wiwas and the Kogis. The other two indigenous groups of La Sierra don't have female shamans. So again, this is feedback from a general public, and the questions that they get when they present this in the theaters in Bogota and Santa Marta. And so they uh, decide to do this film. And of course, there's the house of the women in which they cannot go in. So there's this whole negotiation of how are they going to, in to film? Uh, what is it exactly that they're going to film? What is it that they're going to ask? How are they going to tell the story? How are they going to write, basically? Um, what is going, how it's going to be narrated? So all this discussion takes place for days before the film is actually filmed. They film the film in a very short time, in two or three days. Um, so what they do is they recreate this discussion and they reflexively put it at the beginning of the film. Okay, so what you're gonna see is not a documentary, not an actual discussion, it's a recreation of a very long discussion which they decide to um, act out, let's say, uh, in this moment of presentation of the film itself. So this is the um, beginning of Ushui. Thank you. 
Well, you have subtitles. Yeah. So that's that initial film. This is incredibly rich material. Um, I'll simply highlight a series of elements. Um, um, it's of course the obvious, which is this reverse anthropology of how do they think, um, how do they, um, you know, organize the material and sequences of uh, preference for a type of film, which is probably what they're used to in television and in action films and different parts as the model, which you know the Westerners watch. The other is um, the idea of difficulty of finding a point of origin and beginning, this obsession with where do we begin, which I also think, think is quite interesting to think of through. Uh, for example, that's not this idea of origin, which is, comes through myth again in different ways. The idea that the format that they have and they compare it to is weaving, which is also a constant comparison that comes with music and with songs. The, um, classic books in, in Latin American uh, ethnology link indigenous song making to weaving. So this also comes into the film and the weaving is circular, casting a beginning point that then becomes a circular point of weaving. Uh, but the film is sequential and involves the decision of that sequence. The second, the other element is uh, the idea that you have to edit scenes to show it to the outside. Um, you know, this proce process, if they were going to show it to the inside, you have the same process that you have in La Sierra, which is that you sit for hours listening to the mammals. You just sit on a stone and you listen. Um, and this goes on for 12, 15 hours, and that's what you do. Um, so this idea of cutting up uh, narrative then also becomes, uh, you know, the other element that comes up here. And the of course, there's other elements to point out that we might, you know, talk about um, as well later. So that's um, so. On the one hand, there's this process of reflection on filmmaking that usually is inscribed into all the films themselves into different forms. Um, the other is um, the way the the narrative voice is constituted um, and. I'll, I'll try to speak a little bit above 
because this doesn't have the dubbing. This is a pilot project that was done for get in order to get money for the production of this particular film. So parts of this pilot uh, made it into the film, but parts didn't. Um, it's a film about the sagas, who are the female shamans, but this is framed by the mamo, as you'll see, who is her husband, and who is, um, he's probably one of the uh, most important political authorities of La Sierra, that they have a more public prefer preference, presence, the men, than the women, uh, because they go into the city and outside of the, and from the mountain down into the city. I forgot to say, uh, because I say it at the end, that all of the participants in the film collective are uh, displaced from the mountain by the war. So they, they learned to make film because they were living in the city and these photographers arrived partially to doc document the war. So um, it's the access to the city that provides them uh, this going back and forth. But a lot of people don't come down from La Sierra and then s stay in the city. This is just the filmmakers and other people. So this is the scene um, for the pilot project. One by oneself does not live well. First there was the sun and the moon. If the moon would disappear, there would be no life. When it gets dark, it gives us light. And during the day, the uh, sun gives us heat. So the Wiwa delegation of the Kogi uh, Reserve presents Saga, Women of Wisdom of the Wiwa people. I'll go first. The woman that has the name of Saga and Sheo is the same as water. When the water dries up, nobody can survive. When we are, have heat, it refreshes us, we cook with it and we wash with it. When rain falls, all the plants get fed. That's why in sitting here with the saga, not only I am happy, the nine planets are also very happy. That's what happens. We were left here with the name of saga, which means moon. When the mama receives the power, his wife is also formed as a saga. Because of that knowledge is that we are known. Our mission is to take care of the seeds and nature. That's what has been uh, uh, assigned to us by the fathers, by the spiritual fathers, and that's why we were left on earth. The knowledge of the sagas became weak when the police inspectors arrived with the Capuchin missionaries. They said that they had not studied and that therefore they were not needed. And that we the Mamos were, did not have a right to speak. We were prohibited from learning our own knowledge. And the sagas were also prohibited. We were forced to study a foreign knowledge. Since then we have become weak. That's why uh, to the, our little brothers from Colombia from other countries, we ask you that you please listen to us. Respect our sagas, value their knowledge and study. Be uh, despite the difficulties today, we uh, begin to become strong again. And it is important that you listen to us. That's what I think. So, um, so in this clip, again, there's this mixture of mythical narration with uh, political history. The Capuchin missions arrived in the early 20th century and they were built on the territories of La Sierra. And uh, basically they created a school there and the same history as a lot of people. So they kidnapped a lot of the children, which were orphaned children, um, grew up with the Capuchins and then they had to either hide higher up in the Sierra or uh, eventually in 1983, they kicked them out. 
So uh, from the early 20th century to 1983 is uh, when the Capuchin missions dominated. So you have this, on the one hand, historical decolonial narrative, uh, the recovery of myth narratives as narrated, let's say, in film. Um, and there is one thing that this film will have, Ushui, which is about women, and they say explicitly, which is about water, is the film is supposed to be about women's voices. There's hardly any song making in the film, but there's water everywhere. So the other element is that they wanted to keep some of the songs quite secret and not divulge to the outside. And they just say this one phrase here of, um, you know, the women are related to water. And then they don't say it ever again, but the whole film is about water. There's waterways and there's the ocean and there's walking through water and there's, there's water in every single uh, frame of the film, basically. So the other element that comes up is this level of discussion between secrecy and actual uh, mode of production between the audio and the visual that then becomes you know, uh, a negotiated item um, between in these productions. And finally, I'm gonna show one final clip and then close the talk just to open to discussion is, um, this is again Ushui, and this is one of the clips where uh, one of the sagas is um, actually singing. <laughs> When we interpret the law of origin, we are communicating with our spiritual fathers that are in the mountains when we sing. When we sing, we're, listen, we're heard by in every place. It's when our little brother calls through the cell phone. Their voice is listened by somebody far away. In that way, our own song is listened by our spiritual fathers at a universal level. So again, another layer of inscription of notions of listening and who listens to them on the one hand, uh, but at the same time this comparison to technology, the, the virtual as appearing on the one hand, uh, the communications of technology, you know, here you have here, the, you know, you talk through a cell phone and the person that you're listening is not actually physically there, you know, that's the virtual. And so this comparison between a mythical realm of beings that you don't see but are present uh, technological devices in a way do a parallel type of communication. So this constant communication between technology and uh, the virtual as present in both myth and technology is another element that appears uh, frequently in these films. So I want to highlight then these different elements that center around the idea of listening and um, inscription, let's say, of a particular form of audiovisual production. And I'm going to um, begin to close. Um, throughout indigenous America, the possibility of appropriating film technologies has generated a tremendous amount of excitement from different communities. Uh, in my personal experience, this was not the case with audio recording devices nor with written texts, especially because when I was, you know, working with Mario Hale and and all these other people, they were making recordings to send back to the community, but these never generated the type of um, just love, they love to make films. It's a passion, it's they're deeply engaged, um, and that never happened with <coughs> recording technology in, them in the same way. Those records, those recordings were important, audio recording. Those recordings were important because they would constitute a document of the community, because they could be maybe played on the radio, but they were never, they never produced this site of appropriation of technology and of modes of production in the same, in the same way. Um, while audio recordings have been important devices, they never generated the transnational networks of exchange and interaction that film has generated. And that's the other element. Um, which we find here. So, uh, indigenous audiovisual productions meant for a broad public and not just for indigenous peoples emerged all throughout Latin America since the early to mid 1980s.
According to Amalia Cordova, quote, the documentary has proven to be the weapon of choice for recording subaltern histories, contesting multinational extraction and development projects, and denouncing human rights violations, end quote. The most well-known projects internationally are the Brazilian Video nas Aldeias, Video in the Villages, and the Bolivian Project on Indigenous Film led by Jorge Sanginés, both of which have involved multiple collaborative efforts from NGOs to the nation state and which are um, widely recognized at, st at least in film and um, anthropology. Um, since 1985, Latin America has a yearly film festival of indigenous peoples organized by the Latin American Coordination of Film and Communications of Indigenous Peoples, or CLACTI, which you have the webpage there. Um, this is one of the posters for one of the meetings for resistance of peoples, sacred territory, uh, peoples in uh, risk with grace, risk of extinction, and this is the Colombian version, which is called Daupara. Um, we also find events such as Daupara, the Colombian Indigenous Film Festival, where indigenous film productions are presented to the general public, and which last year celebrated its sixth sixth edition. Such networks of exchange inscribe then the previous acts of listening in a broad agenda that unsettles our own political and epistemological agendas. In recent years, the disciplines of music have become imbued with an ecological discourse. Members of Ecomusicology Group, for example, argue that questions of nature have become the central political problem in, con in contemporary ethnomusicology. And the issue of music sustainability has become the articulator of the contemporary politics of the Smithsonian Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage, for example. In other words, the language of study of ethnomusicology and folklore itself has become imbued with metaphors of nature. This coincides with a growing interest in listening and in sound as phenomena and the institutionalization of sound studies as a disciplinary field. As the different fields of music study get more and more concerned with nature as the central political problem of the present, and I think it, we could ask questions about that, it is perhaps crucial to attend simultaneously to the way that indigenous cultures themselves challenge our own concepts of the relation between nature and culture, and invite us as allies in the co-constitution co of the archive in which we ourselves need to learn to listen. Um, I'm gonna leave it there and open it up for questions. There's of course um, a lot of layers here, and um, I'm not talking about a lot of the conflicts involved in this type of uh, project, um, uh, but all, all projects of collaboration and all projects that involved negotiation between different indigenous groups and non-indigenous groups um, uh, have major issues uh, that are difficult to address, uh, especially when you're caught between politics of representation and um, presence in the nation and struggle for your rights and extractivism, which, it, which involves a lot of money. That is, the mining corporations can arrive with literally, you know, a million dollars and buy out any indigenous group. So these tensions uh, between, um, you know, retention of the land, mythological narratives, and uh, forms of extractivism then um, are, are central then to this recasting of what we mean by these terms. I think I'm interested in this. I mean, those that have read my more recent work also because it, um, it in a way, uh, makes us rethink this relation between myth, sound, uh, and nature, and there's people like Greg that have played. I don't know how many times I've read your book, <laughs> but um, uh, as, as central to the articulation of this, and it's incredible for me that these elements continue to show up in these films. Uh, so, so these are not just films that can be understood as struggles for rights. I think there's a, a lot of layers in these films uh, in which also poetics of mythology and other types of poetics of visual and sonic elements are also inscribed or transformed or uh, you know need to be addressed. So thank you for listening. Right, exactly. You own the subsuelo, the underneath, under the layer after underneath and the earth. So that's why they have right to the mines. Um, there's uh, an element called, 
um, consulta. Uh, the, there is a, a law that got inscribed that is before doing any of these projects, the government has to do an official consultation with the indigenous groups. So um, that official consultation, so often one way of struggling is saying, you did not do this official consultation, and since you, you did not do this official consultation, the project is illegal. So um, several struggles have actually went, been won uh, through that mechanism of, so, you know, you obviated this legal step, and if you didn't do it, um, you know, some of them have been won. The other, so that's one mechanism. Um, the other mechanism which has been done, it's these minor mechanisms, but they've used film. Um, I would have to cue it, but um, they have a film called Resistance in the Black Line, Resistencia en la Línea Negra. So one of the things that happened is they began building a, a port um, uh, right here. Um, for the extraction of coal. So they arrived there with their cameras to, um, and they asked the guy that, that you know they're not gonna be let in. So they asked the guy, you know, let us in. And of course the guy says no and has to explain in front of the camera. So this becomes a public document. And so that is uh, actually quite effective or relatively effective. So uh, the other element that they have used is that they have actually uh, uh, the cameras are effective in, in, in some realms, I'm not sure to the point of the legal realms, but they create a type of public uh, presence that then they have to acknowledge. So the other moment when the camera used, and there it did work, is they learned that the military had arrived, the Sierra, the, the higher part of La Sierra is sacred ground. So they, only, they don't live there, but they have been forced to move higher and higher through the history of colonization. So um, those grounds are very, very sacred, and they heard that the um, government helicopters, the military, that they had militarized the top of La Sierra. And they uh, pay back, they have a, a ritual of payback to the land with um, cotton threads and quartzes. And the military arrived to break the stones under which the quartzes are, are, are hidden. So there was a special, like they knew what they were doing. They were breaking the horses, so they heard about it and they went up with the camera immediately. And so they began filming the process there and it created like a national scandal and they had to leave five days later. So um, in some ways it works as a strategy, but it, these are very, um, and then the others are just very public figures of denunciation in the newspaper and stuff like that. The different indigenous movements have different types of strategies, so uh, what the indigenous people in the, Cauca, in the Sierra use are not necessarily what the people from the Cauca are going to use. They, they use, for example, more roadblocks. Because having a roadblock here doesn't work much. Um, they're not major roads, but in the center of the country, it just works. Uh, so you just block the road, and there's no food for the major cities. There's no transportation. So these marches and roadblocks have been major, major tools of political action. And the government has to sit, you know, after 10 days of the major cities not getting food, the government has to sit and listen to them. There's just no way. So these marches, um, but it is, it's a tight spot. It's a very difficult situation. Yeah. So, but those are some of the strategies. Yes? Uh, this, um, if you like I'm not sure I'm able to answer that question. <laughs> um, this are, these are things that have happened. So the Pacific Coast region or the Cauca region where she works on those. Um, um, the, so what happened, it, this, is the, this is the history. So on the one hand, the government lands grant rights to Afro-descendant communities and to indigenous communities. The moment they l grant land rights, the armed groups begin a dispute 
for the territories, for the control of the territories. And in that particular moment, two types of intervention begin. One is massive agriculture of palm oil, and the other is mining. All of them enacted by transnational corporations. So the moment these territories, so the armed conflict is perfect for driving the people away, the moment that they get land rights in order to develop these major um, corporative uh, elements. What has happened, which is very sad, is that the, the, or it's the most difficult part, is that the armed conflict has rearticulated itself around these major corporations. So uh, if you have a peace treaty on the one hand, um, which I fully support, <laughs> uh, uh, with the uh, guerrilla groups, uh, on the other hand, you have these new, the armed conflict always changes. So you have these new conglomerations of mixtures of people that come from different armed groups whose main role is to protect the mining interests and the mega agricultural corporations. Um, and um, I, don't, they, I, I have no idea about the modes of, you know, the, the people from the Pacific Coast have, also they have this public voice, but again, these are struggle, the historical struggles of colonized peoples are are these small struggles <laughs> that you know seem almost um, irrelevant at the face, but they aren't because they're 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 the constitution of everyday life. So there's no alternative to not do them. That's the question. But, um, how they are successful or not is a is a big issue at this particular moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, question about the say, uh, Oh, I enjoyed your talk. And Thank you. I'm very happy to see the slide of Valle de Sedundoy up there. Thank you for that. <laughs> but um, I wonder if any of this political action uh, that's uh, happening up there, if you've noticed any genres of expressive culture that are kind of highlighted or foregrounded in, the, in, the, in those mobilizations. In the marches and sure. in the marches? Either within the community or in the interface with the outside. Yeah, well, there's um, there's a there's a material culture element which is very important, which is the baston de mando. There's a a staff of um, office. office, okay, and so uh, and especially in the Cauca region because they replaced they they were or they were they were formerly had an armed group, they had an armed, so they decided that they didn't want any armed actress in their session, so they replaced the guns with a baston de mando. So they, they've done a series of actions uh, that where that becomes symbolically very, very important, like extremely important, like a symbol of, of having turned in arms. But this is way before the current negotiations of peace. So that's a long, a longer history. The other is that um, this is not my work. This is the work of two ethnomusicologists in Colombia, which are Mario Eugenia Londoño and Carlos Millano, who have worked with the NASA. So the NASA, 25 years ago, were not singing in their own indigenous language. When, the, when Mario Hene, a little bit more, when Mario Hene arrived in the 1970s, uh, so this whole process of the schooling and language, <coughs> the, the development of materials for, develop it, for working in the schools is central. Textbooks, cartillas. Uh, so there are multiple examples of this, and then the marches also are accompanied by songs and by adaptation of ensembles. So that's a generation ago. The new generation, the younger generation, what they're learning is to play music from the South. Kenas and bombos and so there's a struggle between indigenous generations as to what is the music that would be most typical for them. So you, go, you already have three generations, one that didn't have music, then they began giving highlighting to their own ensembles and the ethnomusicologists participated in this, this. You have a young generation of indigenous people who want to work, learn this indigenous music from the south, from the Kenas and Chanagos on that. So there's already multi-generational work there as to what changes the format. The interesting work also is the work that goes into the school textbooks. So for example, some of the projects have been, um, how do you write a myth into a school textbook? So instead of doing the myth in Spanish and in an indigenous language, and we've, we've done uh, like a three workshops of this, you sit, one group sits and narrates the myth in Spanish. So they, okay, so the, the comic book is seen as really uh, a really good resource because it has, again, visual, and uh, written elements, um, and because you can use a comic book to teach in first grade and second grade and third grade and fourth grade, and you don't have the money to produce material for each grade. So the comic book, and so you um, produce 
there's a group that sits and narrates the myth in Spanish, and there's a group that sits and narrates the myth in indigenous tongue. So of course the narration and the drawing does not have the same structure. So what they do is they put it page, page to page. And to contrast, so they don't do a physical translation of one into the other, but two groups sit and work side independently, and then they put them uh, side by side on the, on the textbooks themselves. So that's been another type of work that's been done. And, um, and, the, and camera work, camera, and media camera work to be published on Facebook, on cell phones, on, that is a central part of the, of the marches. Um, so many of the like, trained ethnomusicologists within the indigenous groups have moved to video uh, and to working on video. They formerly worked on recording, like Innocencia. This is, of course, the production of genres through <coughs> format. But, yeah. yeah. You mentioned, did you know that there was a process of uh, requesting a permission for making of the films? Yes. Okay. How often is a film's permission denied, and, and what's the criteria? They don't, in my experience, they don't deny it, but they're very accurate at, at predicting whether the process will work or not. <laughs> I have no idea how they do this. <laughs> so I, you know, but it's, it happens. So they don't, it's not, once you're there, uh, these are also instrumental relations. One of the, you know, they're real, you know, they're, you help us, they write their own grants at this point. I, you know, they don't need you to write grants, but still, um, they're relations of allies. They, and they're explicit, those relations are very explicit, which I actually like quite a bit, you know. I use you, you use me, you know. <laughs> sort of thing, but it's explicit. You talk about this, and this is the way that it's framed. So, uh, but the, so then when you go into the consultation, in reality, the consultation at that point is not to say no to you. The moment you get there to do that, in a way, they've already accepted you. So the consultation is more to see whether the project itself will work or whether it will have uh, major issues that come to the foreground. So. Uh, when, we, when we began the show, we had gotten this new camera work for film because their, film, their initial films were made for television. And then they became like big, they were shown in major film studio, uh, film, you know, like Cinemark and whatever, in Colombia before Harry Potter. But it didn't work because the color you do for video doesn't work for large film screens. So they needed a film camera. So we got the film camera to do these other films. And so we took it to the same process of the equipment to begin this new process with these new films. And then suddenly he said, you know, I heard a bird and there's something going on. I don't know what it is. It's not with you. It's not with you. It's not with you. Who is it? Who is it? Who is it? Who is it? Let me, let me consult tonight. And, you know, if you have any questions for me, write them on a little paper. Give me that little paper. So I did. I wrote questions. And so the next day he comes and says, there's somebody sick in your family. And I said, yeah, there's somebody sick. So, okay. So that's, you know. Um, that's, that's going to be difficult for the past, and it will. Um, so how this happens and how that, you know, there's these, I have no, <laughs> you know, I, I don't, I have the slightest idea of what happens, but that's what these consultations are then less about saying yes or no than they are about a realm of the real that is very different from the realm of the real that we handle, and um, it is there. I mean, some, like, other anthropologists have written about that. Uh, but so, anyway, it's, so um, I don't. Uh, it's less a denial of permission. If you don't, if they don't want to work with you, they'll make they'll just make everything possible for you never to get to that stage. They don't, you don't have to get to that stage. Yeah. Uh, Anne-Marie, you talked about a kind of history of cultural documentation by outsiders and insiders. Is there a, uh, are archives playing either a passive or an active role presently in those formats? Okay, so of course when you have a digital camera, you produce a film of seven minutes, you have you know 10 hours of filming. That. So there's this question of what to do, and at one point um, uh, there's a, there was a, a very long discussion and a grant writing of what how to do an archive. So the first thing is they have, they also have major projects with um, health. Uh, they have an indigenous hospital that they've created in interaction with the Columbia Health Association. 
So the first thing they said is we cannot separate the archive of film of the archive of health of the archive of this. So we need to, so that they call everything communications. So that we have to have a general communication strategy. So what they wanted to do was to develop sort of a, a, a database or a form of infrastructure of archiving that would include all of those dimensions. But they didn't <coughs> want to separate film in one side, music in another, health data in a different, because they, did, they said it's just, it does not make sense. So um, we presented a project to try to do that, but it did not go through. So um, it's these you know, very short very long-term processes, but there's a big question of what to do with that material once you have it. Right now, it's sitting in the, where the equipment and the computers are, which is in the Casa Indígena, the indigenous house in Santa Marta, where the four groups sort of have their uh, state, <laughs> their bureaucratic center. So they have three rooms there, and that's where all of the material is. Yes? When you were be talking about the Chavez, the women, yeah. it was mentioned that when a man becomes a woman, then his wife becomes a Chavez, is that right? Yeah. Are there any who, are, who don't uh, acquire their status? There are elderly, so, uh, there are two elderly sagas which they also mentioned, uh, which I don't know how they were formed, uh, but they live alone. So, um, I'm not sure how to answer that question. The sagas don't play a role in the outside world. So there is a political division, sort of a theological division between the mamos and the sagas, in which the mamos take care of the political theology of the nation state, <laughs> basically, and the sagas don't participate in that overtly. They do participate in the decision making of who arrives in the communities, but then everybody does, because the first thing they do is they sit you on the stone for like days, and everybody sits and listens to the mama. They don't listen to you, they listen to the mama talk. And you don't know what they're saying, but you just sit there. <laughs> um, and so the women are also there, and then they all talk about, you know, amongst them. And there's a lot of talk back and cross talk. You know, we are the researchers, what's she doing here, thinking that she's coming to this weird researchers of our own culture, you know? So you hear some of the translations and some of the discussions that, um, so, there, there's these collective modes of talking that don't make them into that make it into the films, which is where a lot of this discussion and decision making takes place, and they're internal. Um, and they involve the women on the one side and the men on the other side, and then they uh, collective moments of everybody getting together. So um, I don't understand what's going on in 80% of those because I don't understand the language. I've been in several of these, but you just sit and listen for a very long time, which is, that's the other thing, you listen, you, you just listen. You know, they're used to the mama talking and talking and talking and you just listen. So this inscription of the idea of listening is actually quite interesting, uh, several times in a very short while, uh, because they do that a lot, spend a lot of time with it. Yeah. Uh, this was such a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, uh, just about the, the, the side of the I noticed the films, one of the films started out with the sun and then there was the moon, um, and the sagas of the moon are the men and the sun. Yes, the male. So that would be what I would say. Um, I'm kind of curious about the power relations, because on one hand, I mean, who's making these decisions about what to film and things like that? Um, because on one hand, it sounds incredibly hierarchical. It is very hierarchical. The Sierra is extremely hierarchical. Okay. But it also sounds like everyone's discussing. At the same time. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, what, what I'm curious about. Yes, that. at the same time, but it's extremely hierarchical. It is very hierarchical, and at the same time, there's all these sessions going on, and then the, the, the so that, that relationship, and the Kaukai is very different. So that relationship between hierarchy and modes of listening and discussion is a, 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 a very complex one, but it's a very hierarchical Is, is he required to listen to them? Is there a discussion? Well, there? yes and no, because there's a mechanism of consultation where you go and ask, and he, he has to listen to you. So at the same time he prescribes what you're supposed to do, he is listening to you. So, so the, the mechanisms of consultation go both ways. 
but it is a very vertical uh, grip. Well, now might be a good time to invite everyone to a very casual and humble reception we'll be having on the patio out front here. Um, and if you would, please join me in thanking our guests. Uh,